Hi, Sunil. Can the video off? Yes, please go ahead and start. Chairperson should start now. Yeah, still one minute is there. Good morning, good evening, good day. Welcome to our webinar on changing lives of the poorest of the poor through education. I'm Kandan Modgalya, an alumnus of IIT Madras. I'm an Iraq and Mehru Mehta Advanced Education Technology Chair Professor at IIT Bombay in the Department of Chemical Engineering. <clears throat> I'm the founder of the training method, Spoken Tutorials. I'm also a member of the board of the Wheels Global and Charitable Foundations. I'm proud of the recent recognition given to Wheels by Niti Ayo as an official NGO partner for technology transfer and innovation. My bio, as also the bios of all speakers will be projected on the screen. In the interest of time, I will only make brief introductions and request you to refer to our banners and website for more details on our distinguished speakers. By the way, a recording of today's webinar will be available on our website, wheelsglobal.org and wheelscharitable.org. One of the missions for Wheels is to offer livelihoods and sustainability where solutions do not exist, we encourage research and development at the IITs and other similar institutions through sponsorship. We work collaboratively with partners like IEEE ISV, CII, Mission Samriddhi, Sevak, Spoken Tutorials, and others. Lately, we embarked on an integrated approach for smart village development, where entrepreneurship is at the core of making these projects sustainable. A brief introduction to Wheels activities was presented prior to the start of this event and will also run at the conclusion. We are a volunteer organization and depend on the generosity of our many donors who believe that scale can only be achieved by leveraging technology. You can also get additional information at our website, wheelsglobal.org and wheelscharitable.org. This seminar is made possible by a generous grant from Smita and Ashok Siddhanti of Indina Incorporated, an environmental health and safety consulting company based in Washington, DC. A quick disclaimer, all views expressed by the speakers in this webinar are their own and neither reflect nor endorsed by Wheels Global and charitable foundations or its board and its members. Now some housekeeping messages. All attendees are on mute through the webinar. You may ask questions to the speakers by entering them in the Q&A box. If you need any help, you can chat with one of us by raising your hand or typing your request on the chat box. You may also send us a question by email to info at wheelsglobal.org. A recording of this event will also be available on our website and on YouTube and Facebook. Questions from the audience will be curated and channeled to the speakers by myself. The objective of today's webinar are to learn from the experiences of very successful NGOs on offering education to the poorest of the poor in urban slums and rural areas. There is some noise, I'm just... Uh... 
The challenges for reaching this very remote and diverse populations are many. They face challenges of language, caste, religion, large families in close quarters with both parents working and the other older siblings taking care of the younger ones and even sharing the burdens of running the household. I myself did my entire schooling in Tamil medium in a state government school and had a tough time when I entered IIT Madras. I decided to do something for students who don't have good teachers and who are not fluent in English. As I myself came from a lower middle class family, I designed the method to help those at the bottom of the pyramid. So I would like to now share a small video. Can you please allow me to share my screen? Who's the host? Satyajit. Satyajit, can you please allow me to share my screen? Yeah, please go ahead. Please share now. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Kannan Moggalia from IIT Bombay and Wheels. Spoken Tutorial is a 10 minute long audio video tutorial created to teach open source software. We started this to provide IT training at a global scale to improve the employment potential at the bottom of the pyramid. Our target audience is a remote child working alone at midnight. That's the only time available to her to study and there is no one to help her. Welcome to the spoken tutorial on embedding mathematics in XFIG. We provide free access, dub into India's 22 official languages. C++ में constructors और destructors के spoken tutorial में आपका स्वागत है. नमस्कार बंधुगण, आपना दिशागुत जा रहे हैं आमादेर getting started with Silab नमुक spoken tutorial है. Spoken tutorial चा, creating basic content वरिल पाठाग आपले स्वागत. This is helpful to neighboring countries also as we share common languages. We have samples in international languages also. Bienvenido al tutorial hablado de libre office writer. Spoken tutorial for token chum si vasikum kam. We have more than 1,000 tutorials in English. We have 10,000 dubbed tutorials. Access to internet is not required. We can conduct workshops for 250 or more people. We could conduct a workshop in Myanmar without electricity also. We have trained 6 million students in the past 78 years and also 200,000 teachers. We have lots of topics, introduction, office, programming, advanced programming, simulation, graphic artists, school level software. We conduct job fairs for high performers in spoken tutorial online tests. Tier three, tier four colleges have no campus placements, whereas small companies have difficulty in finding good people. I'm Mayuro Agmode from Pune with Jati Graz College of Engineering. Uh, I'm currently in the final year of computer engineering. There are not companies coming to our college, but I thank to Spoken Tutorial and NASCOM for arranging such a, a beautiful mega job pair. Uh, IT skills training is the tip of the iceberg. We can extend this approach to other skills training also. I present a case study. Welcome to the spoken tutorial on cross cradle hold for breastfeeding. In this tutorial, we will learn about choosing the correct breastfeeding hold for a mother and her baby. We have trained 20,000 health workers, doctors, nurses, and mothers. cross cradle of video here is a baby, one kg baby was refused admission in a local hospital. We trained the mother on breastfeeding. 
here is the same baby after six months. Doctors had given up, but not our healthcare workers. We have more examples before and after. Another example, male god babies. We are extending this approach to several other skills, vaccination, menstrual hygiene, zero budget farming, kitchen garden, road construction, low cost housing, etc. for people at the bottom of the pyramid. We are funded by the government, but funds are stretched. We want alternate source of funding. Here is our website, spoken-tutorial.in. Let's go there. You can see IT tutorials here. School level tutorials can be reached here. Our breastfeeding tutorials can be accessed from here. Here is a donate button, t-shirt button. That's the same t-shirt that I'm wearing. Wear it and support us. Better still, make a donation. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. In the many webinars that Wheels has hosted, we have noticed that the key message that has come out is that when institutions and NGOs start to collaborate, there is a huge multiplier effect. Hence, collaboration, communication, and sharing best practices is a key to better development. As most of us who are involved in philanthropic activities have experienced, it is not easy to scale our work as it requires sustained funding, good organization, focus, and dedicated volunteers, as well as paid staff. The objective of today's webinar is to learn more about models for scaling up charitable efforts, building organizational structures for delivering services, strategies for fundraising, strategies for recruiting and training volunteers and service personnel. I would also like to hear from the panel the impact of the new education policy on their activities. Today's webinar offers us to learn from four highly respected philanthropists who have implemented very successful models with tangible and measurable impact. Our moderator, Mr. Dutiman Banerjee, an alumnus of IIT, IIT Madras, is a very successful entrepreneur based in New Jersey, USA. He started Kolkata Foundation with a focus on West Bengal, and he has supported many worthy causes, among which the Samaritan Foundation is one that is dedicated to education. An amazing story of one man, Mohammed Mamun, who transformed a very impoverished neighborhood in Tikiapara outside Kolkata. Please welcome Dutiman. Dutiman, over to you. Uh, Dritiban, are you there? <clears throat> okay, shall we go to the next speaker if Dritiban is not around? Not sure. Shatri should respond. Karan, why don't you introduce uh, the first speaker and uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, it's a, a real pleasure to introduce Mrs. Uh, Rashmi Mishra, whom I have known for uh, many years uh, from the time they joined uh, IIT Bombay. In fact, we used to live in a place called White House. Just opposite to that was a dump yard uh, between us and the lake. And she converted it into a park. I just can't forget it. <laughs> So anyway, uh, Mrs. Rashmi Mishra started Vidya when she was living on the IIT Delhi campus with her husband, Dr. Ashok Mishra, uh, who later served as the director of IIT Bombay. Rashmi is a graduate of the Lady Sri Ram College in Delhi and her story of how she started Vidya and scaled it to several places, including Goa, Mumbai, and many, other, many others, in fact, Bangalore is missing, many others with tens of thousands of students with some continuing the, continuing their education at MIT and giving back to this wonderful cause. Please welcome Mrs. Rashmi Mishra. Over to you, Rashmi. Namaskar and a very good evening and a very good morning <laughs> to America and good evening for India. I'm very happy Navratri and the Shara to all of you. Uh, I thank you so much, Kanan, for the lovely introduction. 
I'm absolutely denied, delighted and honored to be a part of the Wheels webinar uh, series, a topic which I'm very passionate about, uh, changing lives of the poorest of the poor through education. Many of you who are on this, uh, on, in Wheels and otherwise are alumni of the IITs and, and you have spent your best years in the IIT. You spent four to five years, but I spent 32 years in the IIT, not as a student, but as a faculty wife. And uh, since Ashok was, my husband was taught in the IIT Delhi and then was director of IIT Bombay. Um, I was very fortunate to have this wonderful time at the IIT and feel it's uh, that IIT is our home and you IITs are always be our extended family like Kanan shared. So as Kanan shared, I did start with the uh, inspired by the IIT and, and the contrast, which is actually all our IITs have a big wall around us. Which, which, which actually keeps away the real life. And around every IIT, you'll find a village, a slum. And in IIT Delhi, there was a dirty pool of water that segregated us from the biggest slum of Delhi. And they were always like we shared girls in this dirty water. Little girls who were looking after their younger siblings and had uh, their my mothers had to go to work. So one day I had the courage and I walked up to them. I said, why aren't you in school? This is school, where are you coming from? Don't you know we're girls, girls don't go to school? Only boys go to school. You know, I couldn't sleep for three nights. So I invited them home. I said, look, I'll teach you. Will you come home and I'll learn from me? And they were amazing because I, you know, they, they had that, that glint of joy in their, uh, in, their, in their eyes. They were full of energy, brought them home. And I said, that's how Vidya began. And we were fortunate that the IIT gave us an open air theater from where we continued our education. And Hillary Clinton, uh, she was the first lady and in those days came and visited us and she vividly remembers her trip. And she said, I've come to learn from you how we can educate an entire family and focus on values. So this is, uh, we share a partnership even today with, uh, with IIT Delhi and Vidya ever since then has worked tirelessly for the past 35 years to educate empower India. And we have touched the lives of three lakh 75,000 children, youth and women from the poorest uh, and from the poorest slums of Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, uh, Pune and Gurgaon. And uh, this is what we offer is a very unique holistic education program, a high quality education, training and instilling life skills and values and 60% of our students are girls. I would like to bring you to Vidya and I will seek permission to share my screen with you. Do I have the permission please? So Vidya is a Vidya had a, has a beautiful journey uh, where we have uh, uh, we work out of these five cities I can share with you, and as we all know the story of India and a lot of changes happen in education, but we still need to do a lot of work needs to be done to, done to make that difference. As you see from the statistics I'm sharing with you, we still have a long road to go. Forty-seven million young men and women drop out of school uh, by the 10 standard. We are the youngest country of the world with half our population under the age of 25. Uh, so crucial need is education so that we have a young and educated India. Any one of us who's ever been to a slum will know that what is the life of a, of a less privileged Indian in the slum? Unlettered, malnutritioned, exposed to all the bad influences as women face the biggest challenges because of the discrimination and especially with domestic violence now in the COVID times. Families survive with less than 10,000 a month. And that is the families that Vidya actually educates, the children from these families, the women and the youth from these families. <clears throat> what is our work and our vision? Our, our mantra is to educate, empower and transform. We, our vision is to be the fountainhead of empowering and transforming lives through education. Every Vidya teacher, works on the values that we share with you right here. Excellence, everyday people matter, act with integrity, think forward and global citizenship. These are the programs that we are running at present. And uh, uh, across, this, across the cities we work, you know, the, uh, we are running 78 projects at, this, at the present in these cities. 
And our goal is to make each of our schools and each of our programs a center of excellence, skill building and social change. What is our focus? Our focus is schools and skills. What we address is uh, literacy as a multifaceted, multifaceted and we support our students till they're employed. When we say multifaceted, uh, our program not only includes academics, but we call it the head, the heart and the hand. It's uh, the vocational training, it's leadership, it's life skills and values. And we bring joy to the classroom. Everything is enkindled with love and love for learning. And we hold hands to with our children till they're employed. What our dream in Vidya is to see an India where every child gets a quality education, every youth an opportunity to succeed, and every woman achieve economic and social independence. This is what little Ratna has to share with you. So besides the schools, uh, um, we work with a lot of schools, 44 schools across the country, including our own schools, public private partnership with schools, government schools, and we work with remedial and self-based education from across the country. Uh, what, what we look forward to that every single empowered individual is able to inspire and lead change in their own communities. That is what we aspire for, even with little children. What is our flagship program is the Vidya School Gurgaon. It is on five acres. It is, it is educating 1100 plus students. It has won every award. Our children speak, they are first generation learners. They speak impeccable English and they are, uh, they are actually giving their children in the, from, who, from elite schools a run for their money. <laughs> We've had the mock UN held in the school. We have, our children are uh, competing with them at every level and coming out on top. Robotics, computers, the works. We had a wonderful program where Mr. Narayan Murthy shared that he was very proud to see the Vidya School, that we are one of the premier institutions in the city of Gurgaon and beyond. What I'd like to share is that we have a zero dropout rate and 100% of our students get enrolled into higher education, even if they are first generation learners. 10% of our kids compared to the national average are qualifying Mensa. You see these wonderful institutions. These are where most of our children are studying after they finish with Vidya. And this are not only in the Vidya school, but also from the government schools where we work. In, they are doing extremely well. For us, every student, Every student of Vidya is a role model. But here I'm sharing the story of two special students. One is Sanjana and the other is Daiwood. Sanjana is the daughter of a driver, but studies at Lady Sri Ram College, English honors, and got 96% in her CBSE English, English uh, board exams, 12 board exams. She is a leader of LSR. And uh, she not only, uh, is, uh, not, not only stands out, uh, but she's also helped to transform her father who's a drunkard and she's stopped him from drinking, but her grandmother is what we share here. She, the grandmother has been transformed and the, she stands outside the village to make sure every girl goes to school seeing her granddaughter's example. Daiwood came to us when he was in sixth standard, didn't know a word of English. Within two years in a, what is called a Vidya Beyond School program, he won the Spellby competition of the entire Karnataka. Today he's graduated as a mechanical engineer from the Dayanand Sagar College. A holistic education model works across in many communities, working with children, making sure they don't drop out of school. We know that every child finds identity, meaning, uh, identity, meaning and purpose through connections in the community. And we encourage that. We encourage their, their out-of-box thinking, we, they build their strengths and focus on the unique needs of the girl child, especially. For us, we really believe what Gandhiji said, if you educate a woman, you educate a community. Building capacity for women and capability and confidence is one of our core values. And it's incredible that uh, uh, you know, women who come to Vidya at any age group from 16 to 80 uh, always end up by either starting as part of a self-help group or they get, uh, get, they get, a, they get they, but they all learn IT skills, spoken English, several vocational training skills. And similarly, we have youth, dropout youth, who will give us a second chance through the National Institute of Open Schooling. And we have these across the country. And uh, this has made many of the youth who are earlier working as part-time jobs has dropped out from fifth standard actually employed. One of our youth who's from NIS actually 
uh, engineer and working in Los Angeles, working for the government of LA, one of our first few NIL students. So why is Vidya successful? So we have made sure that we have allowed our, uh, our children to have an education at par with the best in the country. The magic of Vidya is the team, the team of teachers who have a passion and we make sure they create, we give them the, they have creativity and we have leaders who actually encourage that. So that is the magic of Vidya, but also the fact that our ethos provides that the best, the best quality education, the opportunity life skills that, that transform. We also have a very flexible and every individual student is allowed to achieve his dream and we hold hands with each one of them. I think that's the reason uh, why we are successful. For us, values and life skills are very much a part of our work. We, our aim is to create excellent citizens of the country and global citizens alongside. COVID has been a huge challenge, but we rose to the challenge extremely well. We, were, we were got tested, we got strengthened. But what we realized is that uh, it's, it's time has come that we have to let less privileged communities become more vulnerable than ever before. And we have to strengthen them with education and empowerment in their hands. And we want to get them back stronger than ever before. We've, uh, every child at Vidya, uh, 15,000 children of Vidya were given, were given a chance to learn online. We had an excellent webinar series where we all connected from across Vidya. We have 600 plus teachers across Vidya. No child uh, was, was suffered with any problem of ration. We would provide ration, training, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, counseling support. And with great blessings of everyone, nobody got COVID in, in Vidya. So we are very, very fortunate, but we have a long road to go. Partners, uh, you know, we have built up a beautiful grassroots level program in three metros, model schools, projects, which are worth replicating. What we are looking for is that how we can, you can help us to scale. And what will be wonderful is where we need your support is operations cost and infrastructure. In any way that you can help us, that will help. That is the most difficult job for an NGO to provide. We are also looking at your support for helping us to get devices and, and solutions for our 15,000 beneficiaries. Uh, we, are, uh, we are establishing new Vidya schools, which I'll share with you on the next slide. We're also looking for scholarships and financial support, partnership with vocational training. And what we have is a wonderful program called Vidya Mitra, which is, allows you to mentor a child. So uh, it'll, it'll come and be the change and change one child's life by being their mentor. And they speak fluent English and wherever you are, you can actually mentor a Vidya child and help him to make his dream come true. All it costs to sponsor a Vidya child is 120 rupees a day, which is half the cost of a Starbucks coffee. Uh, we offer our students uh, a very high end education and we do not compromise with, uh, with, uh, with quality. Therefore our cost for each child is a little more than another NGO. But if you look at it, it's actually less than what, what it costs the government for a KV or a Kendra Vidyala student. 35,000 for a nurse from nursery to class five, 43,000, which is $600 from class six to class five annual cost. So do look and have a look and see if you can help us in any of these with sponsor our children. So our dream is to create five more Vidya schools, uh, which are role model schools for the country across by 2023. What I like to share is we just launched a brand new school in, uh, in Vidya Bangalore. It's a green school. In the month of November, it's called Vidya Dunmore House. And what we are looking for is, a, is a, a license fee of 12 lakhs, which will help to cover the cost of the rent for the next year. We are also, we have an acre of land available in Gurgaon to build a vocational training center. And we'd be delighted if any of you would like to underwrite or be a, to join us in that as a partner. And uh, we'll be very happy to, uh, to work with you. That is our next big aim as part of the EINP Vocational Training Center for about a thousand children, youth and women. We're proud to share, share with you that we have an amazing group called Friends of Vidya in the US and Canada. And uh, the, the, it's a network of volunteers, partners, donors who help with our projects, sponsor us and give us a lot of moral support. And we're very proud uh, of this network and it's across the US.
Here are details about uh, about uh, about us. Uh, we have a yeah. Uh, we have a we have a Aparna Dave who's based out of Washington DC. Who's helped, who's helped with you for almost twenty years. So do reach out to her, and all the details of our contacts are given here for you. Thank you from all of us. Uh, Vidya has hundreds of donors and well wishes, and that's how we had we managed to give wings to our dreams for the last 35 years. We don't have a godfather. We just have single people, donors, and people who support us. But uh, every contribution is a contribution to transform a child. Here's little Rahul saying thank you to you by saying he wants to grow up to be Vidya's biggest donor. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to your questions and looking forward to chatting with you. Thank you. Uh, Suresh, will you take over? Um, actually, hi, uh, oh. Anand, I'm in, so uh, I can probably fill in. Now. Yeah. Thanks a lot, yeah, Rashmi. My apologies uh, for the delay join, folks. Um, thanks a lot, Rashmi. That was super nice. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Ajit George a graduate of the Indian Institute of Journalism and New Media. He's the director of Operation for Shanti Bhavan, founded by his father, Dr. Abraham George, who started the George Foundation and Shanti Bhavan. The foundation carries out several initiatives dedicated to poverty alleviation, livelihood, income generation, education, health, and empowerment of women. As director of operations, Ajit manages various fields of operation, including fundraising, communications, partnerships, strategic planning, and mentorship and career development. You can learn a lot about Shanti Bhavan and their work with both rural and urban children on Netflix in a documentary titled, Daughters of Destiny, The Journey of Shanti Bhavan. Uh, Ajit also has some excellent TEDx talks, um, which I was watching offline. Please welcome Mr. Ajit George. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the Wheels Foundation today. Um, this webinar is fantastic with a, with a wide variety of uh, excellent speakers and I feel honored to be a part of this program. Uh, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the journey of Shanti Bhavan and um, what, why we started, where we started and where we're going. Uh, in 1997, my father, Dr. Abraham George, um, after a successful career in the United States, uh, decided that he would spend the rest of his life uh, toward philanthropic endeavors in India. Uh, he initially led the largest testing and treatment of lead poisoning ever done in the world, which uh, helped introduce unloaded gasoline to India. But his larger passion was uh, poverty alleviation and income inequality. Um, as an army officer uh, that had freshly graduated from the NDA, he had seen um, a lots of the country and seen the steep inequality between uh, some groups and others, and he wanted to write that. When he returned to India, he looked at, um, Bangalore was where he was invited back to, and he, he saw the city booming, uh, but then he traveled a few hours outside and he saw uh, large portions of uh, the population left behind. Uh, and even within the city, he saw the urban slums and the, the incredible level of poverty there. And he felt this was the place to start. When he started the program, he looked at what was existing programs in the area and what the government solutions were. And what we noticed was that the dropout um, rates were very high, uh, that you know, the, the urban uh, poor and the rural poor uh, usually didn't make it past eighth standard, uh, certainly didn't graduate. And despite uh, throwing a lot of resources into it, we saw this repeated cycle. As we dug deeper and we did studies in uh, the local villages and the urban slums and we, we did extensive surveys, we discovered uh, that about 90% of the constituents and the beneficiaries that we targeted um, had a, one member or more that suffered from alcoholism, right? Alcohol, alcoholism. We also discovered there were very high sexual and physical abuse rates. Um, and we found that many of them did not have a basic uh, utilities like running water or electricity. Then we looked at the solutions of, of, of day schools in the area and we realized it was very hard for a student to stay in school, come home and study, 
um, and then become successful at school uh, with that sort of living circumstance and situation. So we founded Shanti Bhavan as a boarding school and we started all of our kids at the age of four. So preschool is where every single Shanti Bhavan child starts off. And we made that determination based off of the criteria that I just mentioned regarding uh, lack of resources, alcoholism, abuse, but also uh, childhood malnutrition. We wanted to get that to the child early enough so that they did not suffer the consequences of child, childhood malnutrition. So every child starts at Shanti Bhavan at the age of four. Uh, it's a 30 plus acre boarding school where we have our own farm, we grow our own food, um, we have our own cattle for milk, uh, we're mostly a vegetarian and we have a safe, most important, a safe, supportive and loving environment. Every single child starts at, Sh at the Shanti Bhavan at the age of four and they get a holistic education from the age of four until they graduate from 12th standard uh, in the ICSE ISC curriculum. Um, and so our goal is to, to take the poorest of the poor families that are less than $2 a day or 150 rupees a day and give them a high quality education that will enable them to break the cycle of poverty in a single generation. But it isn't simply education. As we began our work, we realized one of the other issues that, that we we're facing was psychological. Uh, working with uh, psychologists in the area and uh, overseas, we discovered there were very high uh, um, issues of uh, um, depression or PTSD in this population. However, over long-term studies, psychologists have noticed that our students have very low rates of depression and very low rates of PTSD because they are removed from the site of trauma. Usually uh, some, they're being traumatized by somebody in the home environment or in the local community. Um, they're removed from the traumatizer um, and they are given a safe, supportive, loving environment with other children of their own age in a fertile environment to learn, to grow, to play, and to interact normally that allows them to escape those psychological deprivations. This was a very important aspect for our uh, approach because we wanted to ensure that we were bringing up holistically sound white collar, future white collar professionals. Our goal is not to simply increase them one step or two steps beyond their parents, but we are looking for a quantum leap. Well, what is the second half of the quantum leap? You have to ensure that they are able to access college. It is not enough for them to simply graduate from 12th standard. As I'm sure all of you know, uh, being IITians, um, they have to go to college and have to go to top colleges. But in most cases, they could not afford it. And maybe scholarships would cover part of it, but not all of it. So part of our mission is to cover entirely the cost of college. Now that includes both uh, the education and tuition, but at housing, clothing, um, and medical care. We cover all aspects of college. So our goal is from the first day of school to the first day of work, a Shanti Bhavan child is 100% covered by our organization. Um, and our, ex our success has been from phenomenal. All of our graduates have achieved um, at their very first job, uh, white collar professional jobs at companies like Goldman Sachs, uh, ExxonMobil, Mercedes-Benz, Amazon, JP Morgan Chase, both in India and internationally, uh, at the top, at top firms, at income rates that are, um, you know, within the first five years of uh, of work, they will have earned more than their parents will in a lifetime. It is a quantum leap forward in their uh, impact and their success. How we've achieved this is been not just simply through education and not even simply through a loving environment, though loving environment is a very important aspect of it. Um, a child needs to know that they're being supported by their teachers, their administrators, um, and the community members. A child will know if you don't believe in them. They will know if you don't love them and care for them. Um, we have found that all, too often 
when a child of, from Shanti Bhavan goes home, you know, their parents may say, we don't believe in you, or they, they will be negative. Uh, they don't have role models to inspire, to aspire to, or to inspire them. So we provide the role models within our environment. Um, that loving environment and supportive environment is incredibly important. But we've also, we're very practical. Uh, and my father from his uh, days as a businessman learned very quickly, soft skills are a huge component to success. And so we have intensive training programs um, in school that is integrated into our curriculum and not simply in English, their, their English is fluent as, as fluent as mine and yours. Um, you know, they would fit in at any dinner, dinner party and be able to converse very easily with any of you. Um, but also in interviewing skills and in um, management skills and in interpersonal skills. We've trained them beyond English, but to think about how to perform well in a white collar professional job so that they are accepted as professionals in a white collar society, that they can become upstanding members of society. And that's really the last component that we think about. It is not enough for one of our children to be successful. If we do that and they have not done no more, we think that we have failed. Um, we instill at them at a very early age two key pillars. And those two key pillars are, first, excellence in all that you do. We tell them um, it is not enough to uh, do average. You should aspire to the very top. And very few uh, people have told them that in their life. But a child knows if you believe in them and you can inspire them and tell them you can succeed, you can be the top. So excellence in everything you do. Uh, and we push them hard. We have high standards. We don't say just because you're poor, we lower our standards. Just because you're poor, we expect less. First of all, we never say, talk about them being poor. We always upbring them and we tell them you are equal to anybody. But the second thing is you can aspire to equality with anybody, that you should score should be the very best. But the second aspect that we say is you must give back. When you have become successful, you have an obligation to society to be a good contributing member of society, of your com local community, but uh, of the state of India. And you should help others in need just as you have been helped yourself. And that impact uh, has made our graduates contribute dramatically to their communities, to their families, um, and those in need. And, and I'll just leave you with a couple of anecdotes uh, that speak uh, to our graduates. This is one of her graduates and her words are, my family was in a lot of debt when I finished college. I had recently lost my father and had money lenders knocking on my door to collect money. I needed to clear all of my father's debts piled up over the years. Thanks to my accounting and finance education at Shanti Bhavan and in college, I was able to get the money lenders to renegotiate terms of loans and I restructured the loans to pay them all over the next five years. For a long time, I used most of my income to clear that debt. Now they're going on to, she's now gone on to support others in the community, um, her, her family members, her cousins um, and others, her neighbors within the community uh, as a high income earner. And here's the second one, uh, another alumni anecdote. This is, we had compiled a report on our alumni because we track the successes of our students. It's not enough to say that they've graduated. We want to tell others where have our graduates gone? What are they doing? So that you can show that your investment with us is a long-term in investment that has a wide ranging impact. It has been four years since I started working and I'll be leaving this month to pursue an MBA on a full scholarship. Working at Amazon for two years, I cover the house rent, cost of, cost of basic necessities, my father's de-addiction expenses, my mother's medical bills, and my brother's education. However, the four of us still live in a single room with one shared bathroom and a kitchen. After Amazon, Amazon I changed jobs to working at the VF Corporation, a leading apparel and footwear company. With an increase in my salary, I moved my family out of the slums into a safer environment with a regular supply of water and electricity. I continue to pay for my brother to attend college and support my three cousins with their education since their father was killed. Apart from the two full-time jobs I've held, I've also held many part-time jobs, teaching, babysitting, and content writing to support my family. 
Um, this young lady, I know uh, her story pretty well, and I can also say that she's helped uh, in her spare time with the disabled and the elderly. Uh, she's volunteered in many different programs as a working professional. So she is not only given money, but she's given her time and energy and her skill sets to those in need. As you can see, our impact is to transform um, the poorest of the poor, those left behind in their community, to high performers white, with white collar professional jobs who are caring, compassionate members as citizens of India, who think of not only elevating themselves, but elevating their families and their communities. And uh, this is sort of the magic of Shanti Bhavan. Uh, if you would like to learn more about Shanti Bhavan, I invite you to see it, to our website at uh, shantibhavanchildren.org or see the Netflix, Netflix documentary series, Daughters of Destiny. Um, the best way you can help us is with a donation to, towards sponsoring a child or towards operating expenses. Um, but we're also in the process of building a second program, second school in Karnataka, and we would love uh, support for the capital expenses of that as well. Uh, it's been a pleasure to speak to all of you and I uh, look forward to any of your questions. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ajit. Um, we will have a Q&A session right after this. Um, so we'll probably defer the questions till then. But it's such an incredible story because you, as you go through these um, stories you hear of, you realize that a single change maker then influences a hundred other change makers who then go on to make a much bigger impact in the world. Um, so it is an absolute pleasure for me to be moderating this session with such incredible speakers that have dedicated their lives to uplifting the marginalized through education. My name is Dritiman Banerjee. I'm an IIT Madras alumnus uh, from 92. Um, I came to the US to finish my PhD and um, since then have been working in the US. Um, each of the social entrepreneurs you hear today have bootstrapped and scaled up their nonprofits to benefit the lives of thousands. And a bit about the background of our organization, Kolkata Foundation. Um, Kolkata Foundation was inspired, um, you know, I started Kolkata Foundation about three and a half, four years back. And the idea was inspired by a New York nonprofit called Robin Hood, which has the tagline, New Yorkers for New York. It has been described by Eric Schmidt as one of the most effective nonprofits in the US, having benefited the lives of millions living in New York City over the past three decades. And what really makes them so successful is that they are extremely selective about the nonprofits they support, but they also work together with these nonprofits to scale their impact, um, to work with them, give them guidance on the aspects of accounting and marketing and fundraising and everything else in order to increase their impact. And our philosophy is extremely similar. When we started Kolkata Foundation, we had three very clear goals. The first was to create a global platform for the diaspora around the world to give back in a coordinated, effective manner, as opposed to ad hoc, disorganized efforts. We wanted to be a bridge between the world's best nonprofits, the Vidyas, the Shanti Bhavans, Prathams and Ekals and Kolkata and use a partnership driven approach to attract the best effective NGOs and ideas to impact social change. And so we definitely believe in a very partnership driven approach, including working with wheels. Uh, this has been an absolute pleasure to be working with both Suresh and Hiten Ghosh on these initiatives. Um, the second thing we focus on is vetting out exceptional NGOs. And we've reviewed over 200 to come up with under 10 that we are supporting or in the process of supporting. And we work with them to scale their impact by not just funding them, but also working alongside to overcome any challenges they have. And uh, you know, our approach is finding, funding, nurturing, growing these nonprofits, very much like a venture capital firm would go and incubate startups and help them grow. And the third thing we focus on is excellence in governance learning from the likes of the Prathams and the Akshay Patras and many of the organizations today, uh, we've been extremely fortunate to build out an exceptional team. Our uh, treasurer is the retired CFO of a $20 billion US nonprofit, Nitin Kota. Um, we also have Shomnath Chengupto who retired as the CFO of Axis Bank, leading all our Kolkata efforts. We are volunteer driven with no paid staff, and the board covers admin expenses so that 100% of the funds we raise can go towards making an impact. 
But really what sets us apart is that we are one of the very few nonprofits which focuses on a specific geography as opposed to an individual cause. And there's some benefits to that. It is a place we know well, we visit regularly, we understand the context, and we're there in there for the long haul. But the other part of it is we look at it holistically. We're not looking at just education, but we're also looking at healthcare and education and livelihoods and skilling and women empowerment, very much like what Ajit just talked about. I don't think poverty is multidimensional and you cannot have point solutions that have outsized impact. And I think it's the same with Vidya and um, the efforts that Ektara have been doing. Um, oh, the approach seems to be resonating and our recent fundraiser had donors from over a dozen countries because they can connect to um, the mission that we have. Now coming to education, I wanted to share the story of one of the most inspiring people I've met in my life, Mamun Akhtar. Mamun grew up in the slums of Tikiapara outside Kolkata um, and Howrah. And because his parents were not able to afford it, he could not continue education past the seventh grade. Now, nearly 15 years ago, he started working as a librarian, starting to teach just six children in his house. That dream has grown over the years. He took over a dilapidated school built 150 years back by Jewish settlers, which had become a drug den and a hub of antisocial activities. And with the support of the local police, he transformed it into a school. He added medical health facilities, a pharmacy, banking facilities, clean water, vocational training for the women in the neighborhood. Today, his nonprofit Samaritan Health Mission has nearly 7,000 children in two schools, all the way from kindergarten to class 12. Now, I work at one of the top hedge funds in New York City, and so our hiring standards are typically among the top 10% of students coming out of Harvard and MIT and Yale and stuff like that. Honestly, I can say I have met very few people in my life with the focus, the leadership, and the intelligence quotient of Mahmoud. And I think um, when the Wheels leadership visited them um, last year, actually beginning of this year, um, they were equally blown away. Um, I first visited Mamun in 2017. I had heard a lot about the wonderful work he was doing. And that particular day, JP Hamilton from Dasra was there with me. Now, if you look outside, this is the neighborhood that he operates in. There's a huge pile of refuse. Um, it's extremely impoverished neighborhood, about 400,000 people in this slum with about, I would say 70, 80% of them below the poverty line. But what blew me away was walking inside and you meet these kids that were studying in school, all dressed in spotless white and blue clothes with such incredible enthusiasm. Um, you can see JP Hamilton in the back chatting with Mamun and one of the teachers. But I think as you walk in, you, the energy was palpable. And that's what's happened, right? Over the years, last two, three years that um, they've had 100% success rate in the batch, um, in their class 10 exams, as well as class 12 exams. And that pile of rubbish has now grown to a five-story building with, um, the, that now houses about 5,000 children. But I think it's not just the fact that the school has grown. Mamun focused on sports. And you know, this is traditionally a Muslim neighborhood. He focused on making sure the girls and uh, had an opportunity to participate in sports. And initially the parents were hesitant. They didn't want the girls to come out and play with the boys. And now routinely these kids play Together, there's a um, sports complex sponsored by Chevrolet um, that, and, and, and these kids are winning um, championships in inter-NGO meets that happen around the city. But the most important thing that Mamun talks about is, look, first is he talks about my jihad. My jihad is against ignorance. My jihad is against, is to make sure that every child in Tikiapara has a proper education. But he also focuses on community service and social causes. And guess what? He, oh, during the recent COVID crisis, he created his Samaritan army of 100 youth that went door to door and um, distributed food, made sure that the infirm were safe. 
and, and you know, and as part of this, what has happened is while he focused on the school, the entire community has changed. There is a sense of optimism. There is a sense of can-do attitude. And this entire community is now looking to just scale to greater heights because of one man's vision and his continued, pers you know, the way he pursued it over the years. On the way back, I was visiting them in February. On the way back from visiting Samaritan, the Uber driver, you know, I just called her Uber. The Uber driver, I started a conversation with him. He said, yes, sir. I went to Mamun school. My daughter, uh, my sister is now at Mamun school. And, you know, it's just amazing how he's enabled this transformation in a community starting with education. So that's, you know, the story of Mamun. You can hear about some of the other organizations that we support at our website, www.kolkatafoundation.org. And with that, I think I want to uh, invite the next speaker. It's an absolute privilege for me, um, Vinita Sara from Ektara Kolkata, which is also one of our supported NGOs. We first connected with Vinita and her team when they were attending the Indiaspora Forum on Philanthropy in Washington, DC. And I've been completely blown away with her fierce determination and dedication and purpose. With a strong commitment to creating educated youths from first generation learners, Vinita has designed high quality, cost effective and comprehensive services for the children from marginalized communities. Using an eclectic approach tailored to the unique needs of each individual child. She has worked on enhancing self-esteem and social skills and education among the young adults in the largest slum area of Eastern India, which is Tikiapar, I'm uh, sorry, is um, uh, Topshia and Tiljala areas. She, along with her partner and co-founder, Namrata Sureka, belong to a community who are philanthropic in nature. However, their area of intervention was where angels fear to tread. It happened per chance as they got to know some of the women while on the board of another nonprofit working against trafficking. She realized that the city's poorest and vulnerable urban communities can only flourish if their girls and women were equipped to drive change in their own lives, families, and community. What started as an informal crash in 2011 with a handful of women and children has Ektara has now grown into the area's most reputed and only English medium pre-primary, primary and middle school project for nearly 850 girls. She would like to take every child under the care of Ektara from an uncertain present to a secure future. Over to you, Vinita. Thank you, Dhritiman, and thank you, Wheels, for having me here. Uh, can I just share my screen, please? Yeah, go ahead, you can share. Okay. So standing here today for Namrata, my co-founder and me is a privilege. My first memory of the 10 women with whom I started working in 2011 is very intelligent, very eager, despite their conditions. They were mothers who were daring to dream and they wanted a life for their daughters. Although they were trapped in the cycle of poverty and oppression, uh, we realized that we had to break that. And that was the reason that Iktara was born. We ventured into alien territory because, and we had no experience, but we just had a conviction that India will only prosper when they prosper and their girls should be the agents of change. This is what drives us out of our homes into the community every day. It is our vision which takes shape and it is the joy and the vibrancy of the girls in school that keeps us motivated. We are working in the largest slum of Eastern India and the criminal, largest criminal hub of Eastern India. These impoverished unemployed migrant communities are living in dreadfully unhygienic conditions and more often than not, they're sharing a toilet with 50 or 60 other people. It's a patriarchal society and the girls are growing up in fears of being trafficked, of exploited sexually, substance abuse and domestic violence are a daily part of their lives. We conducted a random survey uh, just after the pandemic and it had alarming revelations. 88% uh, of our population are earning less than 10,000 rupees, which is $140 a month. And out of these 40% earn less than 5,000 rupees, which is $60 a month. 
the average family size is about five to six members. And this means that 10 to $12 is available per member per month. The stepping stone had to be education. And there was a complete defunct government schooling system. And so the access to basic learning opportunities was not there. All our programs since our inception has been geared to creating a generation of thought leaders. And these are all first generational learners. So the projects that are listed on the slide, they create an experiential environment and they engage the mind, body, and spirit. Uh, our ethos in Iktara is to educate the whole child. So we add music, sports, art and craft, hygiene, digital literacy, health and nutrition. And we also want to equip our children with 21st century skills, which will enable them to use technology in an integrated manner. Uh, we also empower mothers by leveraging the Mothers Forum, and we provide them access to information, skilling, and also provide employment opportunities. We are like a family that addresses every need. We believe that each one of our 1,300 children should have the same opportunity that we have given our daughters, and we must be able to understand each child in their context. The family and the other members are partners in the process of education. We have had years of dialogue with them, and now most parents understand that education is transformative and they even participate in the learning journey of the child. In the light of the pandemic, we saw that there was a need to upgrade the trainings and skills amongst women because none of them had even one earning member in the household. We all agree that uh, the need is more for a multidisciplinary approach. And in Iktara, we use the best tools available so that we can enhance uh, logical thinking and communication skills. And this competence is going to make them lead to them to make informed choices and ensure a better quality of life. So in 2011, when we started engaging with them, we were threatened by the wrath of the male family members. And it was very understandable because they thought we were intruders in their community. There were several stories that were floating around to prevent women and uh, girls from coming to the facility. We must leave is what we were told and or else there would be grave consequences for us. In 2019, one of us students succumbed to uh, self-inflicted burn injuries after being abused. And when I went to a home to meet her parents, the father turned around and told me that if only you were there last night, this would not have happened because Iktara can do anything. This is the community of trust that we built up in eight years. Daraksha, who's a school dropout, she was a severely burnt uh, victim and she came to us to work as a caregiver. She would not even reveal her scarred face. We enrolled her into the open school system. We made sure that she finished school and college and we did a full treatment, including a surgery. Today, Daraksha stands as a fearless community leader. She confidently rides her bike to Iktara she defies patriarchy, she's an inspiration to others, and she supports her abandoned mother. We have transformed many such disadvantaged youths into our workforce. We work towards creating systemic change is what you can see. We are investing in building resilience amongst these leaders. These leaders are going to mobilize other members of the community and are going to be ambassadors of their rights and freedom. We are trying to increase the participation of these young community girls, and they are going to bridge the gap and with increased responsibility and a sense of ownership. Both my co-founder Namrata and me are not trustees in the limited sense. We lead the organization from within with everything that we have. We have created a committed workforce. We have an enviable team of mentors, and all of us are committed to changing the future for our children. I would like to mention here that as full-time uh, chief functionaries, we do not draw anything from the limited resources of the organization. In fact, every year, we contribute more than 10% of the running cost. Therefore, all contributions to Iktara are used optimally, and there is full vigilance and full transparency. We work very closely with a range of partners and volunteers so that we can leverage the best of what is available. We want to improve the quality of our interventions, and we do not want to reinvent the wheel. Because of pandemic, we have been able to forge more partnerships, and this has added great value to our program. 
uh, we have been co uh, we've had a lot of cooperation from the leading schools in Calcutta, and this has opened up a lot of opportunities for our children. We have the pen pal project, we have civic uh, literacy discussions, and this is all helping our children to grow up as global citizens. In the pandemic, we worked with the Gopali Youth Welfare Society, which is run by the students of IIT Kharagpur. And we train their teachers and consequently we also train teachers in their partner schools in other parts of the country on telelearning and distance learning. Before that, we had partnered with a Qatar based organization called Education Above All, and they had trained us in their Internet free education resource bank. And by using this training, we had enabled all our students, irrespective of their age, to be constructively engaged with academics all through the pandemic. We have several partnerships like Slum Jam for music, Skytrop for football, Katha for a reading room to ensure that every child gets access to co-curricular activities. Her Future Coalition based in Florida has supported many of our students. A very valuable collaboration is with Kolkata Foundation who has recently facilitated a certified tailoring course for our women. Uh, since our uh, structured programs are only about five years old, we really have a lot to learn from stalwarts like Vidya and Shanti Bhavan, who have really set examples in delivering quality education. On May 21st, the city of Calcutta was left devastated with the worst cyclone we had seen in a hundred years. The impact of Amphan, which was a cyclone combined with COVID, completely shattered our families and these families had anyway been living a hand-to-mouth existence with no daily earnings. We repaired roofs, we provide essentials, we took care of all their needs while they were combating hunger and uh, waterborne diseases. The families will only support education if their basic needs are met. So we ensured that all our families were safe and they could live with dignity. We were extremely adaptive and we could respond immediately. So some of our learnings through COVID-19 were that firstly, NGOs must pivot based on the situational requirements. So therefore, having a supportive donor network is very important. We realize the importance of the partnership between the educator and the family. We realize that the traditional teaching methods must be more adaptive, inclusive, and application-based. A very important learning was that uh, although government cooperation is integral to scale, there's a lack of adequate support and willingness of the government which damages the system. At this point, it is grassroots organizations like ours that are compelled to go beyond their means for the well being of their families. There were many operational challenges that we had to face in the recent years. For years, we have tried to establish sustainable government partnerships. We have tried to work with authority of schools, which are in our area. We have tried to relaunch vernacular schools as English medium schools, but all our efforts have been in vain. We had to start our own school in 2015, else we would have just worked with government schools. We faced similar issues when we tried to take our mobile schools into the government schools. And these were terminated because we asked for attendance records of partnering government schools. Another problem we have is that most people who have, uh, have, we have encountered, have even some maybe heads of large MNCs, they question us directly about why we work for community other than ours. This is really a shocking mindset and it is not uncommon and we find it extremely difficult to navigate through this. We have even faced a situation where committed donations did not come through because of parochial mindsets. The changes in the FCRA bill have added to our difficult task of fundraising. And uh, in this current year of the pandemic, most companies and PSUs have committed to PM cares and therefore even securing CSR funding has become next to impossible. We have just indicated some amounts on this slide which will go a long way for us. We have also been in conversation with Wheels to be a part of their initiative in Bengal for the field of education. In addition, any support in the delivery of our technology-based learnings will be much appreciated. We also look forward to connecting with those of you who are interested in any of the line items on this slide. We are a very young organization and we need support in every way, especially in fundraising. There is really no alternative to taking everyone along when we want the nation to develop. I just want to end by saying that the entire world is coping with the same crisis and it is the most severe crisis of our lifetime. So 
I would request that we all work together to create a generation of educated girls who may be nurtured by engaged parents and who can be change makers in their homes and their community. Thank you. Thank you, Vinita. That was super. Um, so we'll start off with a couple of Q&A questions uh, for the speakers and then uh, open it up to a couple of questions that'll, that have come in from the audience. So the first question I had is for Ajit. Ajit, as you guys have gone on this journey, what has worked? And equally importantly, what has not worked? Um, so we, we have a few questions, so perhaps try to wrap up in three minutes or so. That way we can, I'm trying to be the debate moderator from yesterday, <laughs> but that's a hard ask. So. I, I'll try to make sure I mute myself. <laughs> um, what has worked? Well, I, I think the, the overall program has been in highly successful. And one of the things that I, I would really like to highlight is um, there's this idea that, uh, you know, that if a child doesn't perform well, um, you know, especially in a nonprofit education pro uh, program that they'll drop out or, um, you know, maybe there's some deficiency on IQ or something like that. And in the initial years, we, um, we had a few challenges, particularly around parents pulling kids out early or, um, you know, there are some coping with the, the very vigorous curriculum. But quickly, we learned to do uh, intensive intervention per child um, with multi-stage uh, support systems, including peer-to-peer -peer tutoring, uh, individualized care and tutoring, um, and uh, other support system to ensure that uh, the, our dropout rate was next to none. So in a, over the last 10 years, we've maybe lost eight kids. You know, that's a pretty uh, substantial maybe. record about our ability to keep our student body um, and keep them educated and motivated. And that also means engaging with the parents and the families as well and ensuring, uh, no, you don't pull out your daughter at 12 and marry her off, or don't pull out your son and put him in the quarry uh, to you know, break rocks to bring some money at the age of 13, but continue to invest in them now so that in the future they will support you. Um, and one of the other things that's been really helpful with being able to do that is even that 12-year-old girl or 13-year-old boy is able to help their families and parents um, when they're back on the summers or in the breaks. Um, they will teach uh, in uh, their, their families and their communities, the whole classes, but they'll also negotiate loans and they'll negotiate at a very young age uh, to help support one of the biggest problems with poverty. What we've noticed is actually not lack of income, which is a huge problem, but also the massive loans they have from these illegal money lenders. And so financial these literacy. Yeah. And so that is something that we've really um, been able to, the kids have been able to support them as well there. So that's been really successful. And one of the biggest challenges, I think this goes back to um, other panelists as well, is that once children hit 12, 13, 14, their parents actually expect them to come and add to the income, family income and keeping them. I think the fact that Shanti Bhavan promises that they will have the resources to go through to college helps make the decision a bit easier for the parents. It, it does, but it, you, it, one of the things you really have to, you know, I think one of our philosophies are we have to be part of the communities, that we can't be separated from the community. So Shanti Bhavan is located in the rural villages that uh, a portion of our population of students come from. And we're constantly having conversations with those families, but we're also doing other things like medical care and community services, food for the elderly, saving pl uh, uh, plans for those who are working, um, you know, during COVID-19, we're doing relief efforts there. Mm -hmm. That engenders trust and belief in the, our work uh, overall, holistically. And so then when we say to a parent, uh, and most of, most of the kids come from single parent households, um, a lot of single mother households, when we say, please invest in our child and in, in your child and don't pull them out early, um, they believe in us and they trust us because we've shown on multiple levels that we are a, um, a integrated member of the community. And that's been very impactful. Thanks, Ajit. Um, Rashmi, I'll have the next question for you. You've yeah. grown this organization over the last 35 years um, to, to massive scale, right? In different cities, 
So can you talk about the challenges of scaling? So, you know, what is very, what has helped us scale is a very clear focus and ethos. Um, and, uh, you know, when we, when we take a teacher in, we actually inspire that teacher to be a pillar of Vidya. I think that has helped a lot. And uh, this program has been so successful. Very, I was what, what the other speakers, Vanita is saying, about, it resonates so much in me because they're so similar in what we do and how we project our work. So what happened is that uh, we very, especially the Vidya School Gurgaon, is it an amazing, we'd love you to visit. So it was a dream actually for us to, to make happen. But basically it, 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 it reflects the whole philosophy of Vidya, which is high, high end education, holistic, where we create a leader. And that is what has made it so simple and easy. It's not been easy, there have been a lot of challenges across, it's not an easy job to do, but I think it was the passion of the entire team. Vidya is a team and is a very successful team. So every teacher is part of that team, every student. Today, the students of the Vidya, the alumni students are actually doing our social media, they're teaching back. So it's an incredible movement today. It's a people's moment of change, and that's what's helped me to scale. And I, I want to do much more because what you've learned in these 35 years is that uh, education has to be, um, you know, it has to be done. It has to be done together as a people's moment of change. Like no matter where you are, whatever, if you want to give back, actually Vidya is open to that. Anyone who wants to come and volunteer or contribute in any form. So that is why we are looking at people who can who can mentor our children because we can educate our children, but how do we change mindsets? Not of the children, but of their families. So it's a, it's a, it's a task that is not just educating, but it's like transforming communities. And what we're doing with our children is we actually, they are the leaders. Our children have become now, you know, they come and tell me that, you know, ma'am, you've educated us. You're not worried, we'll get jobs. But how do we change India? If a 14 year old can say that, uh, that means we've done something right. <laughs> so that is our, so our focus has been this high, the very high quality of of, uh, of life skills, of attitude change, of being that being that outstanding citizen. That's what we try to promote, and that is the magic of Vidya. <laughs> and that's what helped me to scale. And then then it just happens. It happens organically. So example, we're just starting a brand new school in uh, in uh, in Bangalore. It's a complete green school. We are going to have children, youth, and women together in one in one area, and it's happening organically itself because uh, other children are coming to to support it. It's incredible, and then we all are even our women who we work with. We have seven hundred plus women who we work with in Bangalore alone, uh, and they are coming forward to to help in every way because they started self help groups. So we are they are giving ideas. It's just it's incredible. So I. But you know, we are looking at Don't a much larger. It sound thing. easier than it is because I know scaling an organization is really, really yeah. hard. Uh, but I, I agree with you that the team makes a huge difference. The team and and, and, and the focus. If you have the correct and the, the correct ethos, if you, everybody's on the same ethos, and right. what we call is educate, empower, transform is our ethos, then it works. Then everybody's on the same page, and no matter if it's a child, a parent. A, you know, a, a donor or a partner or a teacher, it doesn't matter. We're all on the same page and we're all one. <laughs> I, I agree. But the, the, next question, the next question I wanted to open up um, to all three of you is institutional fundraising at corporates. Now, many of the folks at IITs are in very senior positions at their own companies. Um, what challenges have you faced and how can the IIT Wheels Network help um, direct CSR funding or, uh, you know, people in this forum actually help with fundraising. Uh, beyond giving on their own, is there some ways that they can help influence um, to make a difference? Um, so perhaps, Vinita, if you want to go first. Yeah. So we've had a very um, difficult time with institutional fundraising in the past. And uh, especially in this year, like I mentioned, because all the funding is going to PM Cares. But I think with the uh, also because uh, really because we are a small team and uh, we don't really get much time to reach out to a very wide network. And, you know, honestly, we've just been focusing on our work because we are very new also. So of, of course, if uh, the Wheels network is so big and like 
that's why I said it's a privilege to be here. So if that network can give us contacts where, you know, even if it's applying for grants or if it is like small amount of funding or even just, it, it, it can just start small. It doesn't have to be big institutional funding. And definitely also in a way of, you know, like we still haven't, uh, you know, even cracking the code of the best MIS, uh, how to have the best MIS and everything, because we still are struggling with that as well. So even technology for the best keeping of uh, all kind of data and everything, even if that can help, it'll help us to approach donors in an easier way. So I think technology is another thing which uh, the, the network can help us with very easily. So if we have access to uh, more software, more technology, or even capacity building of our senior staff, senior management staff, even that can help a lot in fundraising for us. Thanks. Ajit, you wanna add on to Vinita's comments? Um, I, I think um, in fundraising, I think about um, the support that can be given is uh, having a foresight about uh, institutional don donations. What we have noticed sometimes with donors are that they think about uh, the work as like six month program or one year program. And, you know, Shanti Bhavan's uh, range is 17 years per child. And we are looking for visionaries to join us in that kind of long term impact. Um, that we'll see a child through uh, their entire time with us from um, the first days of school to the first day of work. That is a really powerful and the most effective way. We've had a number of supporters that uh, step up and they'll sponsor a child or be with us for, for, for years and kind of see through that. And then larger institutional donors um, that uh, invest in the organization over the long term and don't think of this as a single like one one shot grant, but um, a, a continued uh, support of the institution um, and our mission, which allows us to kind of predict how to go forward and how to expand and, and where we can put our resources. Thank yeah. you. With that, I'd like to, uh, Rashmi, do you want to Quickly sure. I'd, love to, I'd love to share. Yeah. So it's it's always a challenge to raise funds because we don't have any proper fundraisers. We just fundraisers ourselves. And our work talks, our work is what we, and our children, uh, when people come to the Vidya school or come to any of our programs, they want to help. It's never easy, especially in the pandemic. But what we're looking for is somebody who can help us with the operations. So if you hassle for an NGO is always space, right? So I only built one Vidya school. It's taken me 35 years to create one Vidya school. I have to duplicate that school. And for example, for the simple, this new Dunmore house, as we call it, the Vidya school Dunmore house, all I need is, is 12 lakhs for the license fee, that's a rent. Somebody helps me with that. You know, It will help us provide an outstanding education to 350 people. Similarly, we have an acre of land available in Gurgaon, which is in Vidya's name. But I, have, I need someone who can partner with me, who can build a beautiful, vocational training center We're in the middle of three slums there, but in Gurgaon, which is the highlight. So that's where I need support, but it's never easy. We have still, we have 1500 kids at present, not all are sponsored. Uh, so any way that people can help. And also like, uh, like uh, Vanita shared, you know, the single, single donors, we don't have a godfather like I said, but we are looking for even single donors who can support a program and be involved in it. Not just give money, but also give their ideas there and share their they expertise. Engage with the journey. Yeah, we love that. And that's Absolutely. that's how India changes. That's how we can bring that I agree. Change. I agree. I with that, I'd like to turn it over to no. Professor Kannan. Yeah. And uh, I think we are running short on time. Um, so, Professor Kannan, if you want to um, uh, give the uh, uh, audience questions that we have. Uh, actually, there are many questions, so we might um, ex uh, extend by about five minutes or so. Uh, one of them is, um, uh, let me start with, what is the impact of the new education policy? Would anybody want to answer this? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I can start a little bit. So the thing is, it's actually very good. It's very good because it's holistic. It's exactly what Vidya has been doing. We've been actually following that process. Now, preschools have become very important. So, uh, and uh, so preschools starting with children at a much younger age, we are looking forward to that. Bringing vocational training in is very essential. I think it's very sensible, but they haven't really outlined the great details on how we're going to implement it, you know? Uh, so we're still struggling with that and we're seeing how we can make it happen. But it's exactly what we've been doing, the holistic concept, the life skills, looking at values, 
looking at preschools, looking at vacation, vocational training. We know who work on the ground that all that is important and that we're already doing. But how do we how do we do that and and get the acceptance from the government because we run CBSE schools, you know, and uh, we work out of primary schools, and uh, so we need that acceptance. The the action points are not being given. Philosophy is great. All right. So there are many <laughs> questions. So I I'm going to uh, first field all the questions, and then if there is a remark or anything else, we can come back. What technologies helped during the pandemic shutdown? So just restrict uh, the answer to two minutes so that we don't exceed uh, by uh, you know too long. What technologies help during the pandemic shutdown? Should I so, go? Yeah, please go ahead. So for us, it was the telephone because our students had no, uh, in, they had no internet. So, and they was mostly just one phone in a family and which belonged to the father mostly. So there has to be time slots where uh, we would have to tell the teachers to contact the kid at that particular time and negotiate with the father to be give the child the phone at that time. So it was quite a struggle to get the phone to the child. And uh, in most cases, they were not even, uh, they didn't have like WhatsApp or anything. So sometimes our community leaders in the community had to go with their phones to the homes of these children. But in spite of that, we reached out to every single child in the community through telephones and WhatsApp. And we made, and like I said, we were supported by a, a Qatar-based organization on this. And the modules that were made were so child-friendly. They were absolutely fantastic. So we also had to raise money for internet and for, uh, for adding charge to the phone and everything, which we were supporting the families with. But the, the module that was there on the, on the phones, it was absolutely excellent. So for us, that was the only thing that worked. And some of our kids who go to other schools, when they started their uh, online classes it became really difficult because you know there was a challenge of living in a room and the family like parents fighting at the back or so much of sound coming and there was no space there was no conducive space for the children to work so although they had the phone there was no space so then what we had to do is within the lockdown we had to open our facility sooner and get the children there so that they could use computers and phones and work from there so for us it was basically the phone but even in spite of that the environment was really difficult for them Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, some people asked, uh, even college students asked me some time ago about uh, only 2G being available in, uh, for example, Jammu, that person was. And he said, how would he access the MOOCs? So, of course, uh, I didn't have an answer. Uh, one uh, answer I could give was to download spoken tutorials and watch them offline. Because in 2G, one can download anything that can be used offline is acceptable. Uh, so, I, so I think that is one of the technologies that we could uh, look for. Uh, thanks for a um, lovely remark. In fact, I have seen that kind of answer even in the TV, how uh, in some of the African countries also they have bandwidth problems and you know people using the phones and so on. So uh, next uh, one, can you use uh, toys and other methods to change how education is imported? Would anybody want to address that? Uh, toys, did you say? Sorry, toys. can you repeat your question? Toys and other methods. Oh, yeah. I, we, yeah. Uh, actually, our whole effort is creative, especially puppets. You know, we make hand puppets. We give uh, through role play and stories. We bring across language. We bring across even science and math. In fact, we're using nature a lot. We use stones and leaves and all these things. So toys are wonderful because, um, you know, the kids need that creativity. So in fact, in our, in our programs, we create a center where they can dress up, they can, you know, they play with toys. So it's very, very crucial. So because that's something our kids in the slums have been denied. They really never had a childhood. They never got a chance. And through stories and through toys, we actually bring across a lot of, even our life skill program, you know, even our life skills for that. And of course the language and maths and anything is possible. And I think that's a much nicer way to bring joyful learning to children. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I course, might also. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, I was just going to add that um, we don't use toys per se in education beyond the toys, a lot of toys at the school for the younger children, and they're, they're part of play, they're part of the learning process. But I, I think of it more holistically that. We value the arts, we value sports, we value all of these as part of a holistic education to build up 
um, you know, a, a interdisciplinary thinking um, and to be um, well-rounded people. So what we've noticed is uh, uh, most of our students are very active in, in sports and a lot of them in music and the arts. And they will be a very good soccer player, football player, a very good uh, pianist, and then also a, a very good student. And that uh, integrated program is really one of the strengths of Shanti Bhavan is that we don't say that they should only be, you know, studying, that they should be part of a larger um, upbringing and well, well-being for their education. Okay. One last question. Thank you. Thank you, Ajit. Um, what modifications would you recommend in education policies to help the poorest of the poor? Would Again, anybody want to didn't get your full question. What? What modifications? You you, what modifications would you recommend in education policies to help the poorest of the poor? I think uh, if I can say something that uh, the entire new the education policy. It has addressed every uh, SCST and all the other marginalized communities, but there has been absolutely no nothing available for certain sections of the minorities. And they have been deliberately left out, it seems, of the entire national education policy, which is why uh, organizations and, uh, you know, like CSOs and everything need to step up here and do their bit for the for these the communities. Because like I said, you know, the nation will only move if every single individual yeah. is being looked after irrespective of who they are and where they are from. So I think that is one part which needs to be modified in the NEP. But I must say that all the policies and all the provisions of the NEP, I think it's schools like ours, which are the nonprofit schools who've been anyway following it, you know, like exactly. uh, doing vocational training and outdoor classes and like a blended learning. In fact, it is the mainstream schools that have been following the more traditional academic methods, which were not creative and not inclusive. Yeah. So I think what we have been doing, whether it was by uh, default or whether it was by demand, we have anyway been following an extremely creative method of teaching, which I think needs to be modified in the entire education system. Okay. I think Thank it's you. similar with Shanti Bhavan and with Vidya. Same thing we'll be doing because that's the need of the hour. That's how you can trans transform and then you can actually educate as we call it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So... Um... Anybody else? Uh, Dhruti, did you want to add anything? Uh, Ajit, did you want to add anything? I think, I think the one thing I would like to add is transparency in the government schools. See, India, if you look at the Pratham report and everything else, there's a lot of access, but the quality is very shoddy, right? And, and there's this parochial, I mean, whatever, there's, the, there's a behavior among the teachers or the principals that they don't want to open up and tell the world how bad that system is. And I think that if there is some way the government can focus on transparency, how many kids are attending classes, what their class, their grades are, are they turning in their homework, how the teachers are doing. I think that can go a very long way in terms of improving the country at scale um, because the nonprofit sector can only go so far. I think the country has a few hundred million children to educate. Thank yeah. you, thank you. Uh, I have my own uh, input on that. Um, I believe that we do too much on the basis of entrance exams on almost everything. It should be based on performance. And mm -hmm. um, we need to come up with a method. Of course, we have tried many uh, things. For example, we did a um, um, FOSI summer fellowship at IIT Bombay. We sent the invi sent invitation to 50,000 uh, heads of departments, displayed a poster and said, these are the problems we want people to try. Whoever does it well, we will uh, bring them to IIT. And we compared the performance of these people after they came to IIT, what they did, compared that with some other uh, selection who entered uh, only through an entrance exam. And these guys had done a lot better for one reason, of course, they had worked on it for a month. They had worked on it. They learned something on their own. They were extremely happy. I think we should go more and more towards the, the actual work as opposed to entrance exam. You know, that is something that I, I would like to uh, contribute. Um, 
is there anybody else who would want to do otherwise uh, i can um, go to uh, con concluding remarks um, yeah okay so uh, let me uh, just get on with it uh, uh, thank you uh, rashmi ajit and vinita for your um, excellent insightful remarks thanks to drithiman for also acting as a moderator i think this uh, time zone is actually quite confusing so i think uh, drithiman missed it by about half an hour if i uh, guess it uh, but i'm happy that you, but i'm happy that you could join and uh, and uh, illuminate us with your uh, remarks uh, thanks also to the entire team of volunteers and collaborators who worked very hard to make this event Uh, happen there are many uh, key takeaways from today's webinar which have been compiled by our great team led by kavita kapoor so let me read out a few uh, students should have access to higher education beyond high school a child should have a loving environment and have role models soft skills are very important such as interviewing skills interpersonal skills such that they have an option to get white collar jobs uh, two pillars excellence in everything they do aspire to be taller than everybody build a culture to give back to the community you come from that is something that came loud and clear educate a girl and educate a generation peer to peer tutoring helps us to keep dropout rate low must keep the child motivated encourage cultural reform such as marriage before 12 for girls education efforts must be aligned with the communities and serve community needs such as covid relief efforts financial support as needed establish trust and become integrated members of the community building trustworthy relationship with communities goes a long way in achieving the objectives of service group and finally high end education holistic um, making leaders has been the philosophy of vidya so these are some of the uh, key takeaways from today's webinar they will be published on our website please our uh, visit our website yeah. wheelsglobal.org and wheelscharitable.org and donate finally thanks to all the attendees and we hope you will join us for the next webinar on november 13th for measuring impact the discussion will be led by dr kavita kapoor mrs jayanti ravi Ms. Deepa Pralad, to be moderated by Mr. Arun Jain. The chairman will be Ambassador Pradeep Kapoor. This is our last event for 2020, as we enter the holiday period, and we will resume our webinars in January 20, 2021. That is, of course, after the next um, um, event. This final event is uh, for the year is not to be missed, as it will attempt to answer the question. how does one measure impact is it only by numbers or also other considerations the speakers are experts on this subject and highly recommend you to register wish everyone um i think uh, i think i'll probably stop here um please uh, keep the many ngos we have hosted and wheels foundation in your minds for the holiday giving of course we will repeat this message once again after the next uh, webinar uh stay safe safe and keep well enjoy the rest of the weekend thank you and thank thanks thank you so much thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. bye bye bye